move on now to clinical microsystems, which is the quality improvement um, approach that's used in many of your emergency departments across the country. And here to chair this session is Philip Crowley, the National Director for Quality Improvement. Thank you, Philip. Thanks very much. Um, I'm very glad to be connected in any way with this session or, and indeed with today. Uh, I suppose the microsystems session fits in, I think, very well with what we've already heard, which is and, and what we've just heard now as well, which I think is like a uh, hopefully all of today is a morale boost because I think you know our morale takes a bit of a pasting at times. Certainly, I find that, and I'm sure you do too, in in the front line. So I think these days are very very important for that reason. But microsystems equally is very very important approach to something that is a fundamental way of trying to get ahead of the crises that we confront every day. We did a staff survey, and one of the key findings in the staff survey was that people didn't feel they had control over their own work environment. They couldn't control the, 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 the situation in which they found themselves. And that's a very disempowered and difficult and unhappy uh, situation for staff to find themselves in. Uh, I think staff engagement is clearly uh, a, a, a way of trying to solve that. It's a key driver in the quality framework that we're, 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 we will be launching shortly from the Quality Improvement Division. And I think it is the key to improving care. Uh, it, the key to improving care, generally speaking, is done by real attention to frontline care processes, listening to the people who really understand them, and that is the people who deliver them. Not the managers, not, not, not the immediate frontline bosses, but the people who actually deliver frontline care. They know how to make things better. And our role as managers, uh, and some of you are managers and some of you are, are frontline uh, staff and some of you are both, uh, is really to get the obstacles out of, out of our staff's way. That should be our primary role, to get, kick obstacles out of their way so that they can, they can come up with their own ideas about how to improve things. And microsystems is a proven method for mobilizing frontline ideas in improving small things, big things, but most importantly, things like teamwork and morale. And I, I, I witnessed it, I went out to Blanchestown to sit in on a uh, microsystems uh, session. And it was really impressive. And I think one of the things that has risen out of that talking <laughs> to the Emergency Medicine Programme, which is a programme that the Quality Improvement Division has always had a very close working relationship with, uh, is that we've decided collectively to ensure that we try and sustain the microsystems work which we're about to hear about. So we will be, we have advertised and we'll be filling a post shortly to work uh, predominantly in emergency departments to keep this really important work going. So I really look forward to hearing about how, it's, uh, how it has developed, uh, seeing how that chimes with my own experience of it, which is immensely positive. And we have some very good speakers who I think will lay it out for us here today. And it's something I hope I commend everybody to really engage with after today, and particularly with this new post from Ian, who will support you in doing so. So I'd like to first of all introduce somebody who, again, uh, building on this morning's chair's uh, kind of uh, characterization of his, uh, his, uh, his introduction. Zuna Geary certainly doesn't need any introduction, but I'll introduce her anyway. And uh, she's going to tell us, she's going to give us an overview of clinical microsystems. And she was really... Uh, uh, Kind of responsible for bringing it to, to this country in the first place. So thank you, Una. I didn't realise I was going to introduce the next person as well. Sorry, apologies. Um, Katrina McGarrell then will come and t tell us a little bit about huddles in St James, which sounds very cosy. Great. Hi everyone. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak to you today about. Um, huddles within our emergency department and some positive outcomes that we've had from that. I also would like to acknowledge um, the guidance and assistance of Valerie Small through this process um, from a clinical microsystems perspective. So just an overview, I'm going to briefly introduce the topic, uh, give an overview of the audit um, that we've completed, some outcomes and improvements and a summary. So initially, uh, the clinical uh, microsystems initiative uh, introduced the concept of a huddle um, in order to um, improve communication among staff, highlight patient safety issues and possible risks for the day ahead. There was a slow uptake initially um, with team members sceptical as to the benefits. We also had an ad, ad hoc data collection um, and collation of uh, information which is where I became involved because I felt we needed to use the information that we were collecting. So currently 8.20 every morning uh, in between our ESIS area and our majors area, um, we have our uh, team briefing. 
uh, the team members gather and it's our consultant on call, but we could also have other consultants who are available on the floor that day. Our ADON are a CNM3, uh, AMP, CNM2, and then a nursing team lead from each of the areas because we have four different zones that nurses work in. Um, our healthcare assistant and always um, a member of the clerical staff as well. And now our information is captured using a specific audit tool. So the data we wanted to collect was what team members were present, uh, staffing level, levels for the next 24 hours to allow for plans, um, number of patients waiting on beds, number of requests for telemetry, isolation and theatre, <coughs> patient safety and staff sta safety issues and risks, any problems with our clinical equipment, um, what audits and research projects were going on during that day because that's a constant evolving process and um, it's just to keep people updated. And again, the key messages for the day and that's probably the most vital part of uh, how we've implemented change through the huddle were these key messages. So from my involvement, I gathered data from May to December in 2014. Um, it allowed me to make amendments to the audit sheet that we used um, to capture additional information and also streamline the form that we were using. Um, the daily information is collated monthly and that allows me to generate a summary report. Uh, quality measures were identified and improvements measured um, as per the PDSA uh, cycle. Um, feedback to staff on improvements, um, we post them in the staff areas um, in main uh, parts of the department. So people coming back from annual leave, math leave, night duty even, now can just pull down the report, have a look and see what's going on. So as you can see, we use the audit cycle in, in how we uh, process the issues, but this is the form that we have completed and this is the third edition of uh, what we started out on. Um, as you can see, the people that are involved that day, um, staffing levels, um, any problems uh, with requests for telemetry, isolation or theatre, your operational issues and any other issues going on that day. So our outcomes. It's facilitated the changeover of the ED patient blood organ sets for specific profiles. So that be for if a patient is medical, if they're surgical or cardiology. So it groups the blood organ sets. It also has facilitated the successful implementation of emergency department viral screen, which is a HIV and hepatitis screening. It was initially a research study, so the key message of, of being involved in that was really successful, and then the changeover into our routine clinical practice, which has been uh, extremely successful. It also facilitates the planning, training and communication for infection control outbreaks, major incident planning and changes to clinical practice. Improvements involve um, our staff hand hygiene um, audit, which improved from 50% to 73%. Uh, our trolley cleanliness audit, which was a dismal 10% up to 80%. And improvements in information on telemetry requirements, which is inpatient cardiology patients that require monitoring. And um, so it gives us an outlook of how that is on a daily basis. Um, just to summarize, daily benefits include um, patient and staff safety, risk assessment from an ED team perspective, and it is very much a, a team perspective um, on a daily basis, um, improved patients, improved staff satisfaction, and reinforcement of important key messages for the 24 hour period. Long term benefits have shown me measurable improvements from the implementation of our daily huddle. Feedback on improvements communicated to staff has definitely increased the buy-in and staff participation in the process. Quality improvement cycles have been shown to, that they can be applied to many on the ground clinical, environmental and organisational issues. Um, daily participation in the huddle can facilitate improvements in multidisciplinary teamwork and communication within the department. Thank you. Any questions? I think we might keep rolling on for the moment, if that's okay. Uh, it's a classic example of something that we don't have enough time for, but we don't have enough time not to have time for it. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those things that if we don't do it, things guy up on us, uh, but we don't feel we don't have enough time to do it to get ahead of the problems of procedures. So, well done. Uh, Maureen Flynn, who works with me, has some guidance on, we call them safety pauses, huddles, whatever, uh, we call different things. It's the same idea though, and, and it, there's guidance on the, on the HC website about it, and Maureen would be very supportive of anybody wish to as I'm sure Katrina would, to try it out as well. It's, it's being used quite widely now, which I think it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous uh, intervention. Uh, our, our last speaker in this session, which uh, 
Uh, again, Kira needs no introduction, really. Kira Martin, who's emergency medicine consultant in Tala Pediatric Department, should be talking about Tala Pediatric ED meets microsystems. Super. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with a, a confession, an apology, and a, a thank you as well. Um, first of all, to confess that when I got the, the email saying, could I come up today and talk about microsystems, I went, do I really have to? I'm sure there's other people on the team. The apology for having that reaction and the thank you for just, actually, it, it allowed me a few minutes to step back, because as you said, we're all very busy. And look at what we did, look at what we've done since we start the microsystems and kind of give me a bit more energy and a bit, uh, a bit more perspective. So thank you, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to talk about our journey. I'm a consultant in the Pediatric Emergency Department in Tala and we were part of the first microsystems journey. I've no helicopters, it's very much a ladybird being a pediatrician <laughs> approach to microsystems. So lots of bits of paper with crayon, literally. Um, the first thing we did was we looked at what our short-term goal was and we got our team together, which wasn't as easy as we thought. We thought we'd come back and everybody would embrace it. But actually, we got a cohort of very interested staff nurses, our healthcare assistant, myself, Charlotte, who is our CNM and has now moved to Temple Street. We were the coaches and with a very small, succinct group, we started off our journey. We were learning the system, as Una said, as we went along, which, which posed problems for us, but we were very well supported by the fact that everybody else was learning it with us, by the fact that we had Una Sinead to come back to, and that we had uh, our faculty in Dartmouth as well, who, were, who gave us expert help when we needed it. And together we, we worked through, the, the, it took us, I'd say, almost nine months to complete one PDSA cycle. So I'm going to take you through that a little bit. First of all, we sat back and defined our purpose, which we never had a, the opportunity to do. So I would have thought, being in the position I was, I'd be like, everybody knows what we do in emergency medicine, everybody knows what we're about. But actually, when we spoke to our GP liaison nurse, they had a slightly different perspective. When we talked to our patients, they had a slightly different perspective. So we talked to everybody, we got everyone's input, and we put together a purpose for our own emergency department. We had laminated signs, uh, printed from photography, which was another project in itself, and we were able to put them up around the department. So you can see there that we're a team of doctors and nurses there to provide emergency care, look after patients and their families. We agreed to provide the care on a 24-hour basis. We work hard to deliver timely expert care. We promote and encourage research and education. And we also, I like the last one there, we promote health and well-being for our patients and also for ourselves because we wanted to focus not only on the patients and the families coming in, but also on the staff providing the care. We learned about our emergency department and one of the, uh, one of the exercises, yeah, it's over there in crayon, is what do you love about your department? What, what drives you nuts? What do the patients love? What, what drives them nuts? We had things like they love that the fact when they come up to the nurse's desk, no matter how busy they are, if their mobile phone has run out, someone will give them a charger to, to charge it. They hated the fact that uh, they had to pay for parking and, and all of those things. So we itemized all of that. We then took the pro forma and looked at what works well in our departments, what doesn't work well. So you can see a few things there. Ambulance registration works well. Answering phones in the clinical area was tough at the time, and we've managed to sort that one along the way too. We then decided to choose our project, and well, that took, that took us a while, and this is a very crude uh, example of a flow chart, and I say Microsoft has improved since then, and we've all got better computers. So we decided that one of the things that people were struggling with was, and it's a very pediatric problem, and I appreciate it's not all that common in adults, but was getting patients up to the ward in a timely manner. So we knew when patients were to be admitted, but we felt there were a lot of delays getting them up to the ward, but our, our timings were, were different. <laughs> And what we did is we sat down and we mapped out all the various things that, that made it difficult, whether the bed was ready, whether it wasn't ready, who was making decisions, whether the patient was ready to go, and then the team would go, well, actually, we need another ECG or we need a blood gas. And we mapped out all of those. 
The team then came to the conclusion, and in, initially I felt a little affronted by this, but put it behind me, that actually the doctors were contributing, the emergency doctors themselves, because the bed would be ready, but the notes wouldn't be ready at the time. So we agreed, collegiately, to focus on getting the notes ready. We did a, a quick test to see what were we doing at the time, and we found that we were, in only 35% of the times were the notes ready, we said 10 minutes after you decide to admit the patient, your notes should be ready. So about 35% of the time, our patient notes were ready, yeah, and we said we'd aim for 90% to be ready in 10 minutes. That took uh, numerous meetings, it took a lot of thrashing out, it took a lot of working out, how are we going to decide when the patient is going to be admitted? That's easy now. We have Symphony. You can click it on the system. How did we know when the notes were ready? So that meant the nurse take at the desk actually writing in the times, uh, chafing the doctors. Have you written the notes and, and taking down the times? We then sat, came back to people and said, OK, we're going to try and have our notes ready within 10 minutes of your decision to admit. And then we discovered that that probably wasn't enough because we had to incentivize people to get the notes ready in 10 minutes. So you can see there that the decision to admit times are, are in, um, they're all the patients we're admitting, and the purple uh, bars are when the notes were ready in time. So we weren't doing too well. We then incentivized our doctors. So we had a star chart. So doctors, when they got their... <laughs> when they got their uh, their notes ready, they got a star, and at the end of the week there was, because uh, we often get boxes of chocolates and, and we keep them, so there was a prize for whoever got the most stars in a week. We went from struggling at about 50 to 60 up to 90%, 100% on some days when the very uh, doctors who were easily incentivized were on. <laughs> um, so we, you can see on the dates of this, this took us a while to get going. But the next year then we were conscious that we really needed to keep an eye on it. So as we worked through our next projects, we went from 100%. We, once a month we did a check. You can see we slipped down in August, probably with the new doctors that we hadn't really got on board. But when we realized we were slipping back down, we, we put in place the star charts again. So something very simple, but something that made actually everybody very happy and part of the patient journey. We, Una had this chart up earlier, and you don't have to read through it, but these were the steps and the changes and the measures that we did along the way. So our small group were learning how to present this. They were going to meetings and presenting the work that we were doing. And all the while, we felt that there was a benefit to the department itself. <coughs> this is Heather Small, and she was uh, it was her birthday last week. So. Um, I'm going to just finish because I, I know it's been a long session because I did a bit of reflection on this to see really was it worth the effort that we put in. It was a challenging adventure, there's no doubt to it. It, it. it was new for all of us. It put a strain on our resources in terms of staffing time. But we did move from a department that didn't have a lot of confidence in itself. And when we had done those early staff um, surveys, we, we realized that and we're a little taken aback. I think in pediatrics, you think everybody loves it and everybody's very happy, but they weren't. So we were able to address that. We had a lot of, I had a lot of expectations that this was going to fly and be absolutely amazing. And it probably my expectations had to change, but as Una said, you learn to enjoy the, the small changes that you make, and actually they make a difference. And when I was going through emails there over the last few days, I saw, and the microsystems meetings now run on a Wednesday. I'm not always there. In fact, I haven't been there for a while, but I can see that actually they did a, a survey last week to check on the times as well, and I can see that people are in the background continually working on it, and that, that actually makes a big difference. The picture on the right there is a quiet room which is being designed in the hospital. So not only do our staff look at things like improving the patient's journey, they've also come back and said, what else can we do for the department? They've taken the initiative and organized water coolers in the department. We've taken a project on to revamp our quiet room for patients and parents. <coughs> this is a picture of the proposed plan for that. And that's actually done by the microsystems group. It mightn't be exactly what it was planned to be in the start, but it is a group of staff who are taking pride in where they work, deciding together on what they need to change and, and feeling that they have the ability and the power within a small frontline group to matter and to make 
for change. Um, another project then is we're looking at the artwork. We have these very elaborate murals in our department for I'd say 10, 12 years and this week, as Mary will know, we've painted over them all and we've started with a blank canvas to kind of integrate more of, of the area and make it feel one, one bigger area. And again, that, that's a project that isn't being totally led out by uh, Mary Tunnels, who's our CNM and myself, but we feel we, we have a group of people now who can work and uh, move projects through that make it better for everybody. The timings, I suppose, when I look back and it may, may need to change and we do struggle at this time of year to get people together, it's incredibly busy. And just one of the thoughts I had over the last uh, few weeks was maybe microsystems intensive projects for us need to be summer when in pediatrics we get a little bit of a lull and we have, you know, that might be when we focus our, our um, brainstorming and what projects are we going to work on and, and get all the initial work done and then maybe the winter time is just a time to keep things ticking over so that might be a new approach that we'll take so we're sustaining it but at a level where everyone is comfortable with it and we're not beating ourselves up about the fact that we can't get to the meetings all the time or that we're not achieving at the pace we like to achieve. So I'm going to stop there if anybody has any uh, questions I'm sure Philip's going to chair that session. Thank you very much. questions unfortunately um, so I think we need to keep moving on so listen well done to everybody uh, you can see again that I think the basic message is their over emergency departments may be very crowded but it doesn't mean that they're in crisis because people are thinking their way through things intelligently and improving things uh, the microsystems work fits in with other things we're doing around frontline ownership, which is another me method that we're, we're trying in, in Tralee around really mobilizing frontline ideas to change, to change things. The only idea is they're going to make a real change, I think. We're also trialing Schwartz rounds, which is a very well-developed methodology for trying to, to, to build teamwork and morale as well, and uh, staff listening exercises. So it, it fits in very nicely with, I think, what we're trying to support around the system and we'll continue to work with the emergency uh, medicine program uh, on that. I just want to give a little plug to the STOP campaign, which is a healthcare associated infection uh, uh, initiative. Mary McKenna and Rob Cunney, who, who many of you may know, will be on to you in, in, the, in the near future, working initially in the RCSI hospitals to try and help reduce device-related uh, infections. So uh, look out for them and it'll be very nice to them. So thank you all very much for this session. It's a very good session, and I'll hand over to the next session. Thank you.